Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring to life the greatest science fiction, fantasy and speculative fiction stories ever written. I am committed to providing these weekly audio narrations free, and without adverts in the middle, breaking up the flow of the story. If you'd like to support The Well Told Tale, and get access to some exclusive patron-only benefits, please do consider becoming a patron by visiting patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's also a link in the description. Today we reach part 5 of At the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft. Our narrator is still in the ancient city hidden behind the Mountains of Madness. He and Danforth, his companion, have discovered many secrets of the ancient past that change everything about how we understand our own role on this planet and who the true masters of it are. Now their curiosity is conquering their fear, and they are about to delve deeper into the city. So, pull up a chair, relax, and enjoy part five of At the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft. Chapter 9 I have said that our study of the decadent sculptures brought about a change in our immediate objective. This, of course, had to do with the chiselled avenues to the black inner world of whose existence we had not known before, but which we were now eager to find and traverse. From the evident scale of the carvings, we deduced that a steeply descending walk of about a mile through either of the neighbouring tunnels would bring us to the brink of the dizzy, sunless cliffs above the great abyss, down whose side aqueduct paths, improved by the old ones, led to the rocky shore of the hidden and nighted ocean. To behold this fabulous gulf in stark reality was a lure which seemed impossible of resistance once we knew of the thing. Yet we realised we must begin the quest at once if we expected to include it in our present flight. It was now 8pm, and we had not enough battery replacements to let our torches burn on forever. We had done so much of our studying and copying below the glacial level that our battery supply had at least five hours of nearly continuous use, and despite the special dry cell formula, would obviously be good for only about four more, though by keeping one torch unused, except for especially interesting or difficult places, we might manage to eke out a safe margin beyond that. It would not do to be without a light in these cyclopean catacombs. Hence, in order to make the abyss trip, we must give up all further mural deciphering. Of course, we intended to revisit the place for days, and perhaps weeks of intensive study and photography, curiosity having long ago got the better of horror, but just now we must hasten. Our supply of trailblazing paper was far from unlimited, and we were reluctant to sacrifice spare notebooks or sketching paper to augment it, but we did let one large notebook go. If worst came to worst, we could resort to rock chipping, and of course it would be possible, even in cases of really lost direction, to work up to full daylight by one channel or another, if granted sufficient time for plentiful trial and error. So, at last, we set off eagerly in the indicated direction of the nearest tunnel. According to the carvings from which we had made our map, the desired tunnel mouth could not be much more than a quarter mile from where we stood. The intervening space shewed solid-looking buildings quite likely to be penetrable still at subglacial level. The opening itself would be in the basement, on the angle nearest the foothills, of a vast five-pointed structure of evidently public and perhaps ceremonial nature, which we tried to identify from our aerial survey of the ruins. No such structure came to our minds as we recalled our flight, hence we concluded that its upper parts had been greatly damaged, or that it had been totally shattered in an ice rift we had noticed. In the latter case, the tunnel would probably turn out to be choked so that we would have to try the next nearest one, the one less than a mile to the north. The intervening river course prevented our trying any of the more southerly tunnels on this trip, and indeed, if both of the neighbouring ones were choked, it was doubtful whether our batteries would warrant an attempt on the next northerly one, about a mile beyond our second choice. 
As we threaded our dim way through the labyrinth with the aid of map and compass, traversing rooms and corridors in every stage of ruin or preservation, clambering up ramps, crossing upper floors and bridges, and clambering down again, encountering choked doorways and piles of debris, hastening now and then along finely preserved and uncannily immaculate stretches, taking false leads and retracing our way, in such cases removing the blind paper trail we had left and once in a while striking the bottom of an open shaft through which daylight poured or trickled down. We were repeatedly tantalised by the sculptured walls along our route. Many must have told tales of immense historical importance, and only the prospect of later visits reconciled us to the need of passing them by. As it was, We slowed down once in a while and turned on our second torch. If we had more films, we would certainly have paused briefly to photograph certain bas-reliefs, but time-consuming hand-copying was clearly out of the question. I come now, once more, to a place where the temptation to hesitate, or to hint rather than state, is very strong. It is necessary, however, to reveal the rest in order to justify my course in discouraging further exploration. We had wormed our way very close to the computed site of the tunnel's mouth, having crossed a second-story bridge to what seemed plainly the tip of a pointed wall, and descended to a ruinous corridor, especially rich in decadently elaborate and apparently ritualistic sculptures of late workmanship. When, about 8.30pm, Danforth's keen young nostrils gave us the first hint of something unusual. If we had had a dog with us, I suppose we would have been warned before. At first, we could not precisely say what was wrong with the formerly crystal pure air, but after a few seconds our memories reacted only too definitely. Let me try to state the thing without flinching. There was an odour, and that odour was vaguely, subtly, and unmistakably akin to what had nauseated us upon opening the insane grave of the horror poor Lake had dissected. Of course, the revelation was not as clearly cut at the time as it sounds now. There were several conceivable explanations, and we did a good deal of indecisive whispering. Most important of all, we did not retreat without further investigation, for having come this far, we were loath to be balked by anything short of certain disaster. Anyway, what we must have suspected was altogether too wild to believe. Such things did not happen in any normal world. It was probably sheer irrational instinct which made us dim our single torch, tempted no longer by the decadent and sinister sculptures that leered menacingly from the oppressive walls, and which softened our progress to a cautious tiptoeing and crawling over the increasingly littered floors and heaps of debris. Danforth's eyes, as well as nose, proved better than mine, for it was likewise he who first noticed the queer aspect of the debris, after we had passed many half-choked arches leading to chambers and corridors on the ground level. It did not look quite as it ought after countless thousands of years of desertion. And when we cautiously turned on more light, we saw that a kind of swathe seemed to have been lately tracked through it. The irregular nature of the litter precluded any definite marks, but in the smoother places there were suggestions of the dragging of heavy objects. Once we thought that there was a hint of parallel tracks, as if of runners. This was what made us pause again. It was during that pause that we caught, simultaneously this time, the other odour ahead. Paradoxically, it was both a less frightful and more frightful odour. Less frightful intrinsically, but infinitely appalling in this place under the known circumstances. Unless, of course, Gedney, for the odour was the plain and familiar one of common petrol, everyday gasoline. 
Our motivation after that is something I will lead to psychologists. We knew now that some terrible extension of the camp horrors must have crawled into this knighted burial place of the eons, hence could not doubt any longer the existence of nameless conditions, present or at least recent, just ahead. Yet, in the end, we did let sheer burning curiosity, or anxiety, or auto-hypnotism, or vague thoughts of responsibility towards Gedney, or what not, drive us on. Danforth whispered again of the print he thought he had seen at the alley-turning in the ruins above, and of the faint musical piping, potentially of tremendous significance in the light of Lake's dissection report, despite its close resemblance to the cave-mouth echoes of the windy peaks which he thought he had shortly afterward half heard from unknown depths below. I, in my turn whispered of how the camp was left, of what had disappeared, and of how the madness of a lone survivor might have conceived the inconceivable, a wild trip across the monstrous mountains and a descent into the unknown primal masonry. But we could not convince each other, or even ourselves, of anything definite. We had turned off all light as we stood still, and vaguely noticed that a trace of deeply filtered upper day kept the blackness from being absolute. Having automatically begun to move ahead, we guided ourselves by occasional flashes from our torch. The disturbed debris formed an impression we could not shake off, and the smell of gasoline grew stronger. More and more ruin met our eyes and hampered our feet, until very soon we saw that the forward way was about to cease. We had been all too correct in our pessimistic guess about that rift glimpsed from the air. Our tunnel quest was a blind one, and we were not even going to be able to reach the basement out of which the abyssward aperture opened. The torch, flashing over the grotesquely carven walls of the blocked corridor in which we stood, shewed several doorways in various states of obstruction, and from one of them the gasoline odour, quite submerging that other hint of odour, came with especial distinctness. As we looked more steadily, we saw that beyond a doubt there had been a slight and recent clearing away of debris from that particular opening. Whatever the lurking horror might be, we believed the direct avenue toward it was now plainly manifest. I do not think anyone will wonder why we waited an appreciable time before making any further motion. And yet, when we did venture inside that black arch, our first impression was one of anticlimax. For amidst the littered expanse of that sculptured crypt, a perfect cube with sides of about twenty feet, there remained no recent object of instantly discernible size, so that we looked instinctively, though in vain, for a further doorway. In another moment, however, Danforth's sharp vision had descried a place where the floor debris had been disturbed, and we turned on both torches full strength, though what we saw in that light was actually simple and trifling. I am nonetheless reluctant to tell of it because of what it implied. It was a rough levelling of the debris, upon which several small objects lay carelessly scattered, and at one corner of which a considerable amount of gasoline must have been spilled lately, enough to leave a strong odour even at this extreme super-plateau altitude. In other words, it could not be other than a sort of camp a camp made by questing beings like us who had been turned back by the unexpectedly choked way to the abyss. Let me be plain. The scattered objects were, so far as substance was concerned, all from Lake's camp, and consisted of tin cans as queerly opened as those we had seen at that ravaged place, many spent matches, three illustrated books more or less curiously smudged, an empty ink bottle with its pictorial and instructional carton, a broken fountain pen, some oddly snipped fragments of fur and tent cloth, a used electric battery with circular of directions, a folder that came with our type of tent heater, 
and a sprinkling of crumpled papers. It was all bad enough, but when we smoothed out the papers and looked at what was on them, we felt we had come to the worst. We had found certain inexplicable blotted papers at the camp which might have prepared us, yet the effect of the sight down there in the pre-human vaults of a nightmare city was almost too much to bear. A mad Gedney might have made the groups of dots in imitation of those found on the greenish soapstones, just as the dots on those insane five-pointed grave mounds might have been made, and which outlined the neighbouring parts of the city, and traced the way from a circularly represented place outside our previous route, a place we identified as a great cylindrical tower in the carvings, and as a vast circular gulf glimpsed in our aerial survey, to the present five-pointed structure and the tunnel mouth therein. He might, I repeat, have prepared such sketches, for those before us were quite obviously compiled as our own had been from late sculptures somewhere in the glacial labyrinth, though not from the ones we had seen and used. But what this art-blind bungler could never have done was to execute those sketches in a strange and assured technique, perhaps superior, despite haste and carelessness, to any of the decadent carvings from which they were taken. The characteristic and unmistakable technique of the old ones themselves in the dead city's heyday. There are those who will say Danforth and I were utterly mad not to flee for our lives after that, since our conclusions were now, notwithstanding their wildness, completely fixed, and of a nature I need not even mention to those who have read my account as far as this. Perhaps we were mad, for have I not said those horrible peaks were mountains of madness? but I think I can detect something of the same spirit, albeit in a less extreme form, in the men who stalk deadly beasts through African jungles to photograph them or study their habits. Half paralysed with terror, though we were, there was nevertheless fanned within us a blazing flame of awe and curiosity which triumphed in the end. Of course, we did not mean to face that or those which we knew had been there, but we felt that they must be gone by now. They would by this time have found the other neighbouring entrance to the abyss, and have passed within to whatever night-black fragments of the past might await them in the ultimate gulf, the ultimate gulf they had never seen. Or, if that entrance too was blocked, they would have gone on to the north, seeking another. They were, we remembered, partly independent of the light. Looking back to that moment, I can scarcely recall just what precise form our new emotions took, just what change of immediate objective it was that so sharpened our sense of expectancy. We certainly did not mean to face what we feared. Yet I will not deny that we may have had a lurking, unconscious wish to spy certain things from some hidden vantage point. Probably we had not given up our zeal to glimpse the abyss itself, though there was interposed a new goal in the form of that great circular place shewn on the crumpled sketches we had found. We had at once recognised it as a monstrous cylindrical tower figuring in the earliest carvings, but appearing only as a prodigious round aperture from above. Something about the impressiveness of its rendering, even in these hasty diagrams, made us think that its subglacial levels must still form a feature of peculiar importance. Perhaps it embodied architectural marvels as yet unencountered by us. It was certainly of incredible age according to the sculptures in which it figured, being indeed among the first things built in the city. Its carvings, if preserved, could not but be highly significant. Moreover, it might form a good present link with the upper world, a shorter route than the one we were so carefully blazing, and probably that by which these others had descended. At any rate, the thing we did was to study the terrible sketches, which quite perfectly confirmed our own, and start back over the indicated course to the circular place, the course which our nameless predecessors must have traversed twice before us. 
The other neighbouring gates to the abyss would lie beyond that. I need not speak of our journey, during which we continued to leave an economical trail of paper, for it was precisely the same in kind as that by which we had reached the cul-de-sac, except that it tended to adhere more closely to the ground level, and even descend to basement corridors. Every now and then we could trace certain disturbing marks in the debris or litter underfoot, and after we had passed outside the radius of the gasoline scent, we were again faintly conscious, spasmodically, of that more hideous and more persistent scent. After the way had branched from our former course, we sometimes gave the rays of our single torch a furtive sweep along the walls, noting in almost every case the well-nigh omnipresent sculptures, which, indeed, seem to have formed a main aesthetic outlet for the old ones. About 9.30pm, while traversing a vaulted corridor whose increasingly glaciated floor seemed somewhat below the ground level, and whose roof grew lower as we advanced, we began to see strong daylight ahead, and were able to turn off our torch. It appeared that we were coming to the vast circular place, and that our distance from the upper air could not be very great. The corridor ended in an arch surprisingly low for these megalithic ruins, but we could see much through it even before we emerged. Beyond there stretched a prodigious round space, fully 200 feet in diameter, strewn with debris and containing many choked archways corresponding to the one we were about to cross. The walls were, in available spaces, boldly sculptured into a spiral band of heroic proportions, and displayed despite the destructive weathering caused by the openness of the spot, an artistic splendour far beyond anything we had encountered before. The littered floor was quite heavily glaciated, and we fancied that the true bottom lay at a considerable lower depth. But the salient object of the place was the titanic stone ramp which, eluding the archways by a sharp turn outward into the open floor, wound spirally up the stupendous cylindrical wall like an inside counterpart of those once climbing outside the monstrous towers or ziggurats of antique Babylon. Only the rapidity of our flight, and the perspective which confounded the descent with the tower's inner wall, had prevented our noticing this feature from the air and thus caused us to seek another avenue to the subglacial level. Pabody might have been able to tell what sort of engineering held it in place, but Danforth and I could merely admire and marvel. We could see mighty stone corbels and pillars here and there, but what we saw seemed inadequate to the function performed. The thing was excellently preserved up to the present top of the tower, a highly remarkable circumstance in view of its exposure, and its shelter had done much to protect the bizarre and disturbing cosmic sculptures on the wall. As we stepped out into the awesome half-daylight of this monstrous cylinder bottom, fifty million years old and without doubt the most primally ancient structure ever to meet our eyes, we saw that the ramp-traversed sides stretched dizzily up to a height of fully sixty feet, this, we recalled from our aerial survey, meant an outside glaciation of some 40 feet, since the yawning gulf we had seen from the plain had been at the top of an approximately 20-foot mound of crumbled masonry, somewhat sheltered for three-fourths of its circumference by the massive curving walls of a line of higher ruins. According to the sculptures, the original tower had stood in the centre of an immense circular plaza and had been perhaps 500 or 600 feet high, with tiers of horizontal discs near the top and a row of needle-like spires along an upper rim. Most of the masonry had obviously toppled outward rather than inward, a fortunate happening since otherwise the ramp might have been shattered and the whole interior choked. As it was, the ramp shooed sad battering, whilst the choking was such that all the archways at the bottom seemed to have been recently half-cleared. It took us only a moment to conclude that this was indeed the route by which those others had descended, and that this would be the logical route for our own ascent, despite the long trail of paper we had left elsewhere. The tower's mouth was no further from the foothills in our waiting plain than was the great terraced building we had entered, and any further subglacial explanation we might make on this trip would lie in this general region. Oddly, we were still thinking about possible later trips, even after all we had seen and guessed. 
Then, as we picked our way cautiously over the debris of the great floor, there came a sight which, for the time, excluded all other matters. It was the neatly huddled array of three sledges, in that further angle of the ramp's lower and outward projecting course which had hitherto been screened from our view. There they were, the three sledges missing from Lake's camp, shaken by a hard usage which must have included forcible dragging along great reaches of snowless masonry and debris, as well as much hand portage over utterly unnavigable places, they were carefully and intelligently packed and strapped, and contained things memorably familiar enough. The gasoline stove, fuel cans, instrument cases, provision tins, tarpaulins obviously bulging with books, and some bulging with less obvious contents. Everything derived from Lake's equipment. After what we had found in that other room, we were in a measure prepared for this encounter, the really great shock came when we stepped over and undid one tarpaulin, whose outlines had peculiarly disquieted us. It seems that others as well as Lake had been interested in collecting typical specimens, for there were two here, both stiffly frozen, perfectly preserved, patched with adhesive plaster where some wounds around the neck had occurred, and wrapped with patent care to prevent further damage. They were the bodies of young Gedney and the missing dog. Chapter 10 Many people will probably judge us callous as well as mad for thinking about the Northwood Tunnel and the Abyss so soon after our sombre discovery, and I am not prepared to say that we would have immediately revived such thoughts, but for a specific circumstance which broke in upon us and set us upon a whole new train of speculations. We had replaced the tarpaulin over poor Gedney, and were standing in a kind of mute bewilderment when the sounds finally reached our consciousness. The first sounds we had heard since descending out of the open, where the mountain wind whined faintly from its unearthly heights. Well known and mundane though they were, their presence in this remote world of death was more unexpected and unnerving than any grotesque or fabulous tones could possibly have been, since they gave a fresh upsetting to all our notions of cosmic harmony. Had it been some trace of that bizarre musical piping over a wide range which Lake's dissection report had led us to expect in those others, and which, indeed, our overwrought fancies had been reading into every wind howl we had heard since coming on the camp horror. It would have had a kind of hellish congruity with the eon-dead region around us. A voice from other epochs belongs in a graveyard of other epochs. As it was, however, the noise shattered all our profoundly seated adjustments, all our tacit acceptance of the inner Antarctic as a waste as utterly and irrevocably void of every vestige of normal life as the sterile disk of the moon. What we heard was not the fabulous note of any buried blasphemy of Elder Earth, from whose supernal toughness an age-denied polar sun had evoked a monstrous response. Instead, it was a thing so mockingly normal, and so unerringly familiarised by our sea days off Victoria Land and our camp days at McMurdo Sound, that we shuddered to think of it here, where such things ought not to be. To be brief, it was simply the raucous squawking of a penguin. The muffled sound floated from sub-glacial recesses nearly opposite to the corridor whence we had come, regions manifestly in the direction of that other tunnel to the vast abyss. The presence of a living water bird in such a direction, in a world whose surface was one of age-long and uniform lifelessness, could lead to only one conclusion. Hence, our first thought was to verify the objective reality of the sound. It was indeed repeated, and seemed at times to come from more than one throat. Seeking its source, we entered an archway from which much debris had been cleared, resuming our trailblazing, with an added paper supply taken with curious repugnance from one of the tarpaulin bundles on the sledges, when we left daylight behind. 
As the glaciated floor gave place to a litter of detritus, we plainly discerned some curious dragging tracks, and once Danforth found a distinct print of a sort whose description would only be too superfluous. The course indicated by the penguin cries was precisely what our map and compass prescribed as an approach to the more northerly tunnel mouth and we were glad to find that a bridgeless thoroughfare on the ground and basement levels seemed open. The tunnel, according to the chart, ought to start from the basement of a large pyramidal structure which we seemed vaguely to recall from our aerial survey as remarkably well preserved. Along our path, the single torch shewed a customary profusion of carvings, but we did not pause to examine any of these. Suddenly, a bulky white shape loomed up ahead of us, and we flashed on the second torch. It is odd how wholly this new quest had turned our minds from earlier fears of what might lurk near. Those other ones, having left their supplies in the great circular place, must have planned to return after their scouting trip toward or into the abyss. Yet we had now discarded all caution concerning them, as completely as if they had never existed. This white waddling thing was fully six feet high, yet we seemed to realise at once that it was not one of those others. They were larger and dark, and according to the sculptures, their motion over land surfaces was a swift, assured matter, despite the queerness of their seaborne tentacle equipment. But to say that the white thing did not profoundly frighten us would be vain. We were indeed clutched for an instant by a primitive dread, almost sharper than the worst of our reasoned fears regarding these others. Then came a flash of anti-climax as the white shape sidled into a lateral archway to our left to join two others of its kind which had summoned it in raucous tones, for it was only a penguin albeit of a huge unknown species larger than the greatest of the known king penguins, and monstrous in its combined albinism and virtual eyelessness. When we had followed the thing into the archway and turned both our torches on the indifferent and unheeding group of three, we saw that they were all eyeless albinos of the same unknown and gigantic species. Their size reminded us of some of the archaic penguins depicted in the Old Ones sculptures, and it did not take us long to conclude that they were descended from the same stock, undoubtedly surviving through a retreat to some warmer inner region whose perpetual blackness had destroyed their pigmentation and atrophied their eyes to mere useless slits. That their present habitat was the vast abyss we sought was not for a moment to be doubted, and this evidence of the gulf's continued warmth and habitability filled us with the most curious and subtly perturbing fancies. We wondered, too, what had caused these three birds to venture out of their usual domain. The state and silence of the great dead city made it clear that it had at no time been an habitual seasonal rookery, whilst the manifest indifference of the trio to our presence made it seem odd that any passing party of those others should have startled them. Was it possible that those others had taken some aggressive action or tried to increase their meat supply? We doubted whether that pungent odour which the dogs had hated could cause an equal antipathy in these penguins, since their ancestors had obviously lived on excellent terms with the old ones, an amicable relationship which must have survived in the abyss below as long as any of the old ones remained. Regretting, in a flare-up of the old spirit of pure science, that we could not photograph these anomalous creatures, we shortly left them to their squawking and pushed on toward the abyss, whose openness was now so positively proved to us, and whose exact direction occasional penguin tracks made clear. Not long afterward, a steep descent in a long, low, doorless and peculiarly sculptureless corridor led us to believe that we were approaching the tunnel mouth at last. We had passed two more penguins and heard others immediately ahead. Then the corridor ended in a prodigious open space which made us gasp involuntarily. A perfect inverted hemisphere, obviously deep underground, fully a hundred feet in diameter and fifty feet high, with low archways opening around all parts of the circumference but one. 
and that one yawning cavernously with a black arched aperture which broke the symmetry of the vault to a height of nearly fifteen feet. It was the entrance to the great abyss. In this vast hemisphere, whose concave roof was impressively, though decadently, carved to a likeness of the primordial celestial dome, a few albino penguins waddled, aliens there, but indifferent and unseeing. The black tunnel yawned indefinitely off at a steep descending grade, its aperture adorned with grotesquely chiselled jams and lintel. From that cryptical mouth we fancied a current of slightly warmer air, and perhaps even a suspicion of vapour proceeded, and we wondered what living entities other than the penguins, the limitless void below, and the contiguous honeycombings of the land and the titan mountains might conceal. We wondered, too, whether the trace of mountaintop smoke at first suspected by poor lake as well as the odd haze we had ourselves perceived around the rampart-crowned peak, might not be caused by the tortuous channelled rising of some vapour from the unfathomed regions of the earth's core. Entering the tunnel, we saw that its outline was, at least at the start, about fifteen feet each way, sides, floor and arched roof composed of the usual megalithic masonry. The sides were sparsely decorated with cartouches of conventional designs in a late decadent style, and all the construction and carving were marvellously well preserved. The floor was quite clear, except for a slight detritus bearing outgoing penguin tracks and the inward tracks of those others. The further one advanced, the warmer it became, so that we were soon unbuttoning our heavy garments. We wondered whether there were actually any igneous manifestations below, and whether the waters of that sunless sea were hot. After a short distance, the masonry gave place to solid rock, though the tunnel kept the same proportions and presented the same aspect of carved regularity. Occasionally its varying grade became so steep that grooves were cut in the floor, Several times we noted the mouths of small lateral galleries not recorded in our diagrams, none of them such as to complicate the problem of our return, and all of them welcome as possible refuges in case we met unwelcome entities on their way back from the abyss. The nameless scent of such things was very distinct. Doubtless it was suicidally foolish to venture into that tunnel under the known conditions, but the lure of the unplumbed is stronger in certain persons than most suspect. Indeed, it was just such a lure which had brought us to this unearthly polar waste in the first place. We saw several penguins as we passed along, and speculated on the distance we would have to traverse. The carvings had led us to expect a steep downhill walk of about a mile to the abyss, but our previous wanderings had shown us that matters of scale were not wholly to be depended on. After about a quarter of a mile, that nameless scent became greatly accentuated, and we kept very careful track of the various lateral openings we passed. There was no visible vapour, as at the mouth, but this was doubtless due to the lack of contrasting cooler air. The temperature was rapidly ascending, and we were not surprised to come upon a careless heap of material shudderingly familiar to us. It was composed of furs and tent cloth taken from Lake's camp, and we did not pause to study the bizarre forms into which the fabrics had been slashed. Slightly beyond this point, we noticed a decided increase in the size and number of the side galleries, and concluded that the densely honeycombed region beneath the higher foothills must now have been reached. The nameless scent was now curiously mixed with another and scarcely less offensive odour, of what nature we could not guess, though we thought of decaying organisms, and perhaps unknown subterrene fungi. Then came a startling expansion of the tunnel, for which the carvings had not prepared us, a broadening and rising into a lofty, natural-looking elliptical cavern with a level floor some seventy-five feet long and fifty broad, and with many immense side passages leading away into cryptical darkness. 
though this cavern was natural in appearance. An inspection with both torches suggested that it had been formed by the artificial destruction of several walls between adjacent honeycombings. The walls were rough, and the high vaulted roof was thick with stalactites, but the solid rock floor had been smoothed off and was free from all debris, detritus, or even dust to a positively abnormal extent. Except for the avenue through which we had come, this was true of the floors of all of the great galleries opening off from it, and the singularity of the condition was such as to set us vainly puzzling. The curious new feeter which had supplemented the nameless scent was excessively pungent here, so much so that it destroyed all trace of the other. Something about this whole place with its polished and almost glistening floor struck us as more vaguely baffling and horrible than any of the monstrous things we had previously encountered. The regularity of the passage immediately head, as well as the larger proportion of penguin droppings there, prevented all confusion as to the right course amidst this plethora of equally great cave mouths. Nevertheless, we resolved to resume our paper trailblazing if any further complexity should develop, for dust tracks, of course, could no longer be expected. Upon resuming our direct progress, we cast a beam of torchlight over the tunnel walls, and stopped short in amazement at the supremely radical change which had come over the carvings in this part of the passage. We realised, of course, the great decadence of the Old One's sculpture at this time of the tunnelling, and had indeed noticed the inferior workmanship of the arabesques in the stretches behind us, but now, in this deeper section beyond the cavern, there was a sudden difference wholly transcending explanation. A difference in basic nature as well as in mere quality, and involving so profound and calamitous a degradation of skill that nothing in the hitherto observed rate of decline could have led one to expect it. This new and degenerate work was coarse, bold, and wholly lacking in delicacy of detail. It was countersunk with exaggerated depth in bands following the same general line as the sparse cartouches of the earlier sections, but the height of the reliefs did not reach the level of the general surface. Danforth had the idea that it was a second carving, a sort of palimpsest formed after the obliteration of a previous design. In nature, it was wholly decorative and conventional, and consisted of crude spirals and angles roughly following the quintile mathematical tradition of the old ones, yet seeming more like a parody than a perpetuation of that tradition. We could not get it out of our minds that some subtly but profoundly alien element had been added to the aesthetic feeling behind the technique, an alien element, Danforth guessed, that was responsible for the manifestly laborious substitution. It was like, yet disturbingly unlike, what we had come to recognise as the Old One's art, and I was persistently reminded of such hybrid things as the ungainly Palmyrene sculptures fashioned in the Roman manner. That others had recently noticed this belt of carving was hinted by the presence of a used torch battery on the floor in front of the most charismatic designs. Since we could not afford to spend any considerable time in study, we resumed our advance after a cursory look, though frequently casting beams over the walls to see if any other further decorative changes developed. Nothing of the sort was perceived, though the carvings were in places rather sparse because of the numerous mouths of smooth-floored lateral tunnels. We saw and heard fewer penguins, but thought we caught a vague suspicion of an infinitely distant chorus of them somewhere deep within the earth. The new and inexplicable odour was abominably strong, and we could detect scarcely a sign of that other nameless scent. Puffs of visible vapour ahead bespoke increasing contrasts in temperature and the relative nearness of the sunless sea cliffs of the great abyss. Then, quite unexpectedly, we saw certain obstructions on the polished floor ahead, obstructions which were quite definitely not penguins, and turned on our second torch 
after making sure that the objects were quite stationary. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed listening to this fifth instalment of At the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft. Please do consider becoming a patron of The Well Told Tale by visiting patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. Your support there will help me keep these weekly episodes free for everyone, and there are also patron-only benefits of signing up. That's all for this time. I'll be back next week with the finale of this story. I hope you can join me. <laughs>